God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord? Your faithfulness also surrounds you. Let's ask God's blessing on us. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of drawing near to the God of heaven who is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. We worship and adore you as the maker of heaven and earth, the preserver of all things by your word of power, the saviour of your people. We thank you that your, your power, like your knowledge and your wisdom and your grace, is utterly unsearchable. And we worship you in and through your Son, the Lord Jesus, that great gift that you've given to us of a Saviour. We pray that by the presence of the Holy Spirit and his power at work in our hearts tonight, we might, uh, today, we might worship you aright as we ask it in our Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. Reading this morning from the prophecy of Amos, chapter 6 and chapter 7. And then a short piece from uh, Acts 15. Let's hear the word of God. Woe to you who are at ease in Zion and trust in Mount Samaria, notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel comes. Go over to Calne and see, and from there go to Hamath the great, then go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these kingdoms? Or is their territory greater than your territory? Woe to you who put far off the day of doom, who cause the seat of violence to come near, who lie on beds of ivory, stretch out on your couches, eat lambs from the flock and cows from the midst of the stall, who sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments and invent for yourselves musical instruments like David who drink wine from bowls and anoint yourself with the best ointments, but are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore they shall go, uh, now go captive as the first of the captives, and those who recline at banquets shall be removed. The Lord God has sworn by himself, the Lord God of hosts says, I abhor the pride of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore I will deliver up the city and all that is in it. Then it shall come to pass that if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. And when a relative of the dead with one who will burn the bodies picks up the bodies to take them outside of the house, he will say to the one inside the house, Are there any more with you? Then someone will say, None. And he will say, Hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. For well, behold, the Lord gives a command. He will break the great house into bits and the little house into pieces. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plough there with oxen? Yet you have turned justice into gall and the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. You who rejoice over Lodibar, who say, Have we not taken Carnaim for ourselves by our own strength? But behold, I will raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord God of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of Arabah. Thus the Lord God showed me. Behold, he formed locust swarms at the beginning of the late crop. Indeed, it was the late crop after the king's mowings. And so it was when they had finished eating the grass of the land, that I said, O oh Lord, forgive, I pray, or that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. It shall not be, said the Lord. Thus the Lord God showed me, Behold, the Lord God called for conflict by fire, and it consumed the great deep and devoured the territory. Then I said, O oh Lord God, cease, I pray, Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord relented concerning this. This also shall not be, said the Lord. Thus he showed me. Behold, the Lord stood on a wall made with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. 
And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. Then the Lord said, Behold, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will not pass by them any more. The high places of Isaac shall be desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. I will rise with the sword against the house of Jeroboam. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel said to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear his words, for thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive from their own land. Then Amaziah said to Amos, Go, you seer, flee to the land of Judah, there eat bread, and there prophesy, but never again prophesy at Bethel. For it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the royal residence. Then Amos answered and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, nor was I the son of a prophet, but I was a sheep breeder and a tender of sycamore fruit. Then the Lord took me as I followed the flock, and the Lord said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. Now therefore hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not spout against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city. Your sons and daughters shall fall by the sword and your land shall be divided by survey line. You shall die in a defiled land and Israel shall surely be led away captive from his own land. Chapter 9 and verse 11 on that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David which has fallen down and repair its damages. I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes him that who sows seed. The mountains shall drip with sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their land, and no longer shall they be pulled up for the land. from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. And then in Acts in chapter 15, and from verse 6, this is the account of the council at uh, Jerusalem. Uh, as people were discussing, or the church was discussing, the necessity of, uh, of um, circumcision or not in, in the New Testament church. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose and said to the men and brethren, you know that a good while ago God chose among us that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And after they had become silent, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things. Known to God from eternity are all his ways. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble these from among the Gentiles who are turning to God. 
Amen. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Well, we turn again to Amos and to uh, chapter 6. As you know, we're taking a sort of broad overview of the book in just uh, a few sort of visits. As we've seen, um, this book is about the prophet Amos coming with the voice of God that he depicts as a roaring lion about to pounce on the people to whom these words are addressed. I've mentioned before that the word roaring for a lion, as he has here in uh, chapter 1, verse 2, and chapter 3, verse 8, is the roar of a lion. There's two words in Hebrew for that, and the one word that he uses is the roar of a lion as it pounces to destroy its prey. So it's a warning, a warning of impending judgment. The Lord had called Amos as a, from being a shepherd in Tekoa in the south in Judah, and had sent him way up into the north uh, to the kingdom of Israel with this very difficult message that Amos was to deliver to the Lord's people. And it's the final section here of the book in which these judgments now are spelled out in some detail. And the sec- section begins there in verse 1 of chapter 6. Woe to you. Woe to you. And you'll have gathered from the reading earlier in chapter 6 and 7 uh, that this final section is a grim uh, message of judgment against, against Israel. A message that was certain to in, infuriate them, as we saw with Amaziah in chapter 7. He was made angry, and he says to uh, Amos, Get back to Tekoa and earn your bread there. We don't want to hear you up here. And uh, that's, that's because... Amos really made things uncomfortable for these people as they received uh, God's word. And his was a disturbing message, a message that challenged the people of God uh, about their way of life, uh, the way they were conducting themselves, and, uh, and so they react strongly against his, his message. It disturbs us. It's not a comfortable thing, is it, to be confronted by the word of God? when it challenges us, and Amos challenges us here, forcing us to think also in different ways about our lives in relation to God. So in chapter 6 we read God's warnings to Israel, and we find again this repeated principle that we find throughout the Scriptures, that when God comes in judgment against a people, either individually or corporately, he never does that without warnings. And the sheer number of the occasions in the Old Testament prophets when God sends words of warning to people can't but impress upon us the remarkable patience of God. He is, as the old Bible translations uh, would put it, long-suffering. He suffers long with people. And we see that his judgments then were not the result of some whim or caprice. God doesn't suddenly send a judgment, but it, ar- it arises not out of a, a sudden outburst of anger in God, but only after he has sent repeated, unheeded warnings. Again and again, he lays out for them his standard of righteousness and godliness and tells the people, I really mean this. You really need to take this seriously. And he pleads with the people for a hearing. Sometimes he lavishes his goodness upon them so that the goodness of God might lead them to repentance. Sometimes he chastens them with all manner of troubles so that the chastening of the Lord might lead them to repentance. But always patience with God again and again. Always repeated warnings before, as it were, the lion eventually pounces. So we notice the warnings in verses uh, 1 and 3 of chapter 6 with that phrase, Woe to those who are at ease in Zion. That is, woe to those who are complacent. And verse 3, woe to those who lie on beds of ivory, he he says. Uh, Now, now what's the issue there? What What is God actually warning these people about? What are the things that are attracting God's Discipline, God's chastisement, God's judgment upon the people. Because that's the abiding value of this book for us. There are four things mentioned here, four 
what we might call diseases of the soul that we need to take seriously. And the first of them is complacency, spiritual complacency. Woe to those who are complacent in Zion. As you get towards the end of the message of Amos, you find that God is deeply concerned about the security of his people, about the fact that he has secured them, they are protected. So whatever he does in terms of disciplining the people, nevertheless, they are his people and they are secured absolutely. God preserves them through all their troubles. He may discipline and chastise them in various ways, but if they are his people, he secures them in his purposes. And yet there's such a thing, you see, as false security. And that's what Amos is driving at here. These people to whom Amos is speaking are resting in a false sense of security. And we're all susceptible to that, aren't we? All of the time. When you've lived for some time in a safe, crime-free environment, it's very easy to become complacent, to uh, think, well, I don't need to lock the car, I don't need to lock my shed, I don't need to put a chain around my bicycle. And then when you've done that for some time and lived like that for some time, you become quite sure it's all going to be okay. And then unexpectedly, you get back and your bike isn't there anymore. And your car, as someone's rummaged through your car and taken some precious possession, or your home has been invaded by some burglar, lulled to a sense of false, a false sense of security. But you see, that can happen in spiritual things too. In some Christian circles, it's possible for people, uh, for Christians, and many do, lay a false sense of security on some decision made years and years ago to follow Jesus. And you might hear Christians say, well, I know that person isn't living as a Christian now, but, you know, many years ago, they made a decision for Christ. Meaning, well, then they must be saved. They made a decision for Christ. The question I would want to ask is, exactly what did that person decide? What did they decide 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? Because since then, then there doesn't seem to be a shred of evidence that they've known the grace of God at work in their life. And that, you see, is a false security then to look back to some decision that was made. Because when the grace of God takes hold of someone's life, there will definitely be evidence of that. There'll be something to be seen in that life. And the evidence that Amos speaks about here, he describes with the use of this image of the plumb line, you see. This is why... God is depicted in this book as holding a plumb line. What's the plumb line for? Well, the plumb line is used to determine whether or not something is truly perpendicular, whether it's straight, whether it's upright. And here we see the Lord God depicted as holding a, a plumb line in his hand, and he's looking for evidence of grace in the life of these people. Now notice that this false sense of security is based on shaky foundations. Their complacency resulted from an undue regard of their position and their privileges. In verse 1 of chapter 6, Woe to you who are at ease in Zion, that's their complacency, and trust in Mount Samaria. Notable persons in the chief nation to whom the house of Israel Comes. You could translate that, those which are named, you notable men, that's their position, notable men of the foremost nation, that's their position and their privilege. They had a position, notable people, they were privileged, they belonged to the foremost nation. Here were people then in position of leadership. It was to them that the people were coming, notable people. They had a name, they had a reputation, and they belonged to the chief nation. And that gave them a sense of security. We are notable people. You can ask anybody. They all know our name. 
we have a position. We've got a reputation in the, in the chief nation amongst the people of Israel. It's a perilous, perilous thing, though, you see, to put confidence and trust in position and in a reputation or some privilege that you enjoy as a Christian. That's a perilous thing to do. Position and privilege don't provide anyone with any kind of real security. You may belong to a gospel church. It may be has a reputation for its commitment to solid Christian ministry, to reform ministry. And all the while you can be hiding from God in that congregation. It's very easy for, for someone to do that. And here Israel laid claim to all kinds of privileges without recognising and remembering that in God's mind, privilege always amounts to responsibility. So the question we must face is this, that if I have enjoyed real privileges as a Christian man, as a Christian woman, what have I done with them? What do I do with my privileges? Have I used those privileges to become the sort of person God would expect me to be, having enjoyed those privileges? Striking to notice the word Amos uses in verse 1, which in our translation is chief. Notable persons in the chief nation, here in the uh, New King James Version, the, the word there is the word first. Notable persons in the first nation. The next time you see that word is in verse 7, where the Lord says to them, you will be the first into exile. They were saying, we belong to the first of nations. God says, yes, and you'll be the first into exile. Why does he say that? Because great privileges place us under great responsibility. That's why complacency, spiritual complacency, is a deadly disease. And as we see here, this is a word to leaders, especially to the leaders, notable men, a sobering, challenging word to the leaders of God's people. Complacency, complacent about the warnings they had be give, been given. That's the point of verse, verse 2. Go over to Calne and see, and from there go to Hamath, the the great and go down to Gath of the Philistines. Are you better than these nations? Go and see what God did to them, he says. The Assyrians wiped them off the face of the planet. The Philistines, who had been the scourge of Israel for all those years, where were they now? What had God done to them? Well, he had sent Assyria and he had just wiped them off the planet. It's very easy to become complacent, saying, learn the lessons of history, see what God has done. The second thing he warns about is procrastination in verse 3, that phrase, you put far away from you the evil day, the day of doom. And that, that phrase there, um, it's, we, we say, don't we, you put off things, some onerous task that you're not not really thinking happily about and you say, oh well I'll put that off for another day and here Amos is saying, you're putting far away the evil day, you're putting off the day of doom, procrastination speaking about the day of judgment and they're saying, ah well you know yeah well it might be coming but they've promised that the doom is coming for so long and it still hasn't come Peter writes about the same attitude doesn't he in his second epistle People who are saying, well, where is this promised coming then? We see no signs of it. Putting away the evil day. Well, yes, sometime, never. Woe to you, he says in verse 3, who put far, from, uh, who put far off the day of doom, who caused the seat of violence to come near. You put off the evil day, you think. What you're actually doing is bringing near the reign of terror. They're saying there isn't going to be a judgment. They're putting that far away. And what they're doing is setting up the seat that could be thrown, actually, the throne of violence. They thought there was no urgency to deal with all this that was wrong in the nation and in their own lives. Procrastination, putting off the evil day. No need to worry about what's wrong in my life, he says. I'm going to put it all off. And the Lord says, 
You're living as if these are things not to be concerned about. Don't you believe it? You may think you're putting off the evil day. What you're actually do is doing is enthroning violence. You're enthroning anarchy in your life. It's another way of translating those words. The seat of violence. Enthroning anarchy. In other words, you do what pleases you. So there's a complacency about spiritual things, there's a, placen a complacency about your own soul, there's a false sense of security, procrastination that makes you think there's no urgency in dealing with God and the things of God in your life, and you say, well, yes, one day I'll get around to it. The third warning is about indulgence in verses 4 through 6. And it's an indulgence that comes in several ways. It's an indulgence, it's an evidence of their spiritual sickness. They indulge in an excess of laziness, luxuriating in excessive la laziness. Verse 4, you lie on beds of ivory, you stretch out on your couches. Emphasizing, us, uh, emphasizing there, the scholars tell us, not so much the luxury as the laziness of it. Laziness can ruin us. They indulge in excessive eating. You eat the lambs from the flock, the calves from the midst of the stall, he says. And, and that's emphasizing gluttony. Verse, uh, and then uh, there's an excessive indulgence in, in, that's very interesting, beauty divorced from truth and holiness. That's the point of verse 5 there, you see. You sing idly to the sound of stringed instruments, you invent for yourselves musical instruments like David. David, you remember, used his instruments and his voice and singing in the worship of God. It was an instrument of holiness. And of course, there's nothing wrong with music and musical instruments. That isn't what God was concerned about with these people. But here God's people were indulging in a love of music and a love of beauty, but not in the service and worship of God. They divorced beauty from truth and holiness. There is such a thing, you see, as arts without God. In a secular godless society, art doesn't dis disappear. But you do see the arts divorced from truth and divorced from holiness. A love of beauty continues even as culture around us degrades and the worship of beauty develops. Some commentators suggest that that's what is meant by the phrase in verse 6, you anoint yourself with the best ointments. That is, they're using expensive lotions to make themselves beautiful, just like the sort of cosmetic industry today supplies the same desire in people today. It's a love of beauty, but it's all divorced from truth and from holiness. Now, the arts are capable of being used for the glory of God. Art, literature, drama, music, in all sorts of forms, all the arts can be aimed at promoting the glory of God. But when the love of God, in its many forms, is divorced, or sorry, the love of beauty in its many forms, is divorced from the love of God and truth and holiness, then they become corrupted, as we see. That's the indulgence he's speaking about in verse 5. So there's to be a caution about that. The worship and appreciation of beauty divorced from a love of truth and holiness. But notice what they were not concerned about. They were not in the least concerned about the corruption of Israel. Verse 6, he says, You are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. That word affliction, breaking. The breaking of, jo of Joseph. Now what he's alluding to there, of course, because he's talking to the people of God, he's talking about that time when Joseph's brothers threw him into that pit in Dothan. And then we're told, sat down and ate a meal together whilst their brother was crying out in the pit. And Amos is, is saying that the ruination of Israel is crying out to these people. It should be crystal clear to them what's happening to the nation. And all the while, they're feasting and lying on their beds of ivory. Nobody cares about it. They're stirred by beauty, 
They're stirred by music, but there's not a flicker of concern about the spiritual degradation of God's people. And he says to them, therefore you will be the first to go into exile and there will be distress in almost every form. Look at what we read in verse, verse 9. Then it'll come to pass that if ten men die, or if ten men remain in one house, they shall die. And when a relative of the dead, with one who will burn the bodies, picks up the bodies to take them out of the house, he will say to the one inside, is there any more with you? Then someone will say, none. And he'll say, hold your tongue, for we dare not mention the name of the Lord. Some think that that means that the coming judgment will bring about a fear of God and they'll be so afraid of God that they'll be fearful even to mention the Lord's name. I'm, I'm not convinced of that myself. Seems far more likely that this is just another indication of the spiritual dis decline of the nation. As we saw last time in verse in chapter 5, they were still holding religious festivals. But in everyday life, they'd expunged the name of the Lord. Just as you know and have experienced in your workplace over the years, where you can talk about anything else, talk about anything. But you get the very clear message, hold your tongue. Don't mention the name of the Lord. Not here, elsewhere maybe, but not here. And we see in verse 9 and 10 that even when it comes to funerals, and the disposal of the bodies, the Lord's name, was not to be spoken. Doesn't that resonate today? Then there's a fourth thing, the fourth disease of the soul. He's warned them about their complacency, about their procrastination, about their life of indulgence. And now he speaks about the distortion of true values. That's what he's driving at in verse 12. Do horses run on rocks? Does one plough there with oxen? Well, of course you don't try to do that. How can you plough amongst rocks and boulders? You wouldn't try to do that. And yet the whole life of the people of God has been so distorted that they're behaving in a way that is contrary to nature and the natural order of things. He says there in verse 12, You've turned justice into gall. Justice has been turned into poison. The very idea of justice has become poisonous to them. They've turned the fruit of righteousness into wormwood. That is something bitter, something like vinegary, sour. They've become cynical about the whole idea of godliness, about a righteous life and a godly character, a character measured by the plumb line of chapter 7, cynical about honesty, astounded that people would do the right thing when it will cost them to do it. Why would anybody behave like that? That's how these people are thinking. That's a very serious indication of spiritual disease. The fruit of righteousness turned to wormwood. Just having a distaste for that. Why would you want to live like that? And look at what they do find pleasurable in verse 13. You rejoice of, over Lodabar. Now if you've got uh, side references in your Bible, you might see that the word Lodabar means nothing. That's what it means, quite literally, nothing. You're rejoicing over nothing. And you're finding your pleasure in nothing. Like, like children chasing bubbles. Yesterday I was watching Griff trying to catch Bubbles. Bubbles are very attractive, aren't they? And on a sunny day, they will capture the rays of the sun and you'll see all these swirling colours there. And they're so attractive. And you try to grab it and it just pops. And what have you got? A little spot of dirty water in your hand. What is it? It's nothing. It's nothing. And yet many people are living their lives chasing bubbles and even Christian people they live to possess what seems to be so attractive and when it finally comes into their grasp they find they've got nothing but a little spot of dirty water they've been living for nothing it's an expression you see of the distortion of true values and again we need to remember that he's speaking here to the people of God where and what are our values are my values drawn from scripture 
from the New Testament, or am I being directed by the values of a corrupt and rotting world? It's a very important matter and a very important question to put my, to myself. And for those reasons, the Lord says to them in verse 14, Behold, I'll raise up a nation against you, O house of Israel, says the Lord of hosts, and they will afflict you from the entrance of Hamath to the valley of Arabah. And then follows three visions in chapter 7 uh, that the Lord gives to Amos. The first is a vision of locusts in verses 1 to 3, and evidently that's a vision of coming judgment. And then there's a vision of judgment again in verses 4 through 6. It's a vision of fire. And in both cases, we're told in verse 3 and verse 6, the Lord relents. In both cases, it's a response to Amos's prayer. Oh, Lord, forgive, I pray. Oh, that Jacob may stand, for he is small. So the Lord res- relented concerning this, we read. And then the third vision in verses 7 through 9 of the plumb line. But on that occasion, Amos does not pray. And the Lord does not relent. And the plumb line is in God's hand and he keeps it there amongst his people. Do you see in those verses how the divine mercy is married to the believing prayer of God's servants? Now, this is something that sometimes perplexes Christians, the idea of God relenting, or as the old authorised version has there, repenting. How can God be thought of repenting? Well, remember how Amos speaks to and of God in this book. Repeatedly, he uses the phrase, the Lord God. The Lord God showed me this. The Lord God showed me that. And then when he speaks to God, he says, oh, Lord God. And that phrase, Lord God, uh, is, is, is meaning sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord, forgive The Sovereign Lord showed me. The Sovereign Lord who wills and does whatever he pleases. The Sovereign Lord who took Amos from anonymity in Tekoa in the south and used him in his purposes to accomplish his will and purpose through Amos's prayers and prophecy. Because in the mystery of his providence, God takes up his servants and he teaches them to pray. And it's not that Amos changes God's mind, but through Amos's prayers, God is revealing his purpose. Because ultimately, God's purpose is not judgment, but mercy, you see. That comes out at the end of chapter 9 in in verse 14. Did you notice that in our reading? As you get to the end of the book, after all these words of judgment, the Lord says, I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They will plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They will also make gardens and eat fruit from them. Because his great purpose, you see, is not judgment, but blessing. The problem with Amos's generation is that they didn't want that blessing. They didn't want it. They weren't interested in it. And so often that's what's wrong with us. So often that can be characteristic of our lives, my life and yours. God longs to bless. He's told me the way of blessing and how to walk in his blessing, but I go my own way. And I expect him to bless me anyway. That's always the mark of an unconverted life but can also be seen in the lives of God's people from time to time, disregarding God's word and yet expecting God's blessing. Well, God longs to bless, but he blesses in his way. So there's this mysterious connection between believing prayer and divine mercy, and this is why we cry to God, to have mercy on our nation. And it's the secret of God's continuing mercy. And... It's the secret then of God restraining his judgment. Little prayer meetings. Maisa Kummer, Astrid Manach, Kevin Hengoyd, Nelson. Thousands of other little villages and towns and in our cities. Gatherings, very often small gatherings of believers, pleading that God would restrain his judgment and have mercy. 
What's the point of praying, people ask, against the great issues of the day? When we see all the things that confront the nations of the world, what is the point of a handful of people gathering for prayer? Well, I'll tell you. It's because God acts in response to the prayers that he lays upon the hearts of his people. And if we could only see the reality of things in God's world and God's universe, we'd realise that the issues of the day are not settled in Washington or Moscow or Beijing, but in the courts of heaven and in response to prayer. Do we believe that? That's what God tells us. And if that's so, how ought that to affect our lives and our priorities in life? In chapter 8, he tells them again that he's going to judge. In verse 5, we read of people who are longing to make money. They say, when will the new moon be passed that we may sell grain? And the Sabbath that we may train, uh, trade wheat? They, they're more interested in gain than they are in God. They make the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit. They're trading dishonestly. They're skimping on their measure and they're charging an inflated price. And they falsify the scales by deceit. They care more for gain, for profit, than honesty. And they care more for gain and profit than they do for people. That we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. The, the word there, bad wheat, is the sweepings. In other words, after they've winnowed the wheat, all the rubbish that's left on the floor, they sweep that into the bag as well. They care so much about the profit, so little about the people, that they'll sell them short, and they'll sell them rubbish, and they'll do it at an inflated price. In verse 10, he says... I will turn your, I'm sorry, uh, yes, I will turn your feasts into mourning, all your songs into lamentations. I'll bring sackcloth on every waist, baldness on every head, and I'll make it like mourning for an only son, it's an, and its end like a bitter day. In other words, my judgments are going to come, and they're going to grieve. Behold, the days are coming, he says in verse 11, 11 that I will send a famine on the land. Now, people are complaining about how difficult life is today. None of us would like a famine of bread and water, but he says, not a famine of bread, not a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They'll wander from sea to sea and from north to east. They'll run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. Now remember again, this is written to the, word, uh, to the people of God. This isn't a message of, to pagans, this is a message to God's people. And he says to them, as they refuse to value and treasure and receive the blessing of the word of God, he'll take it from them and they'll end up wandering from place to place, looking for it, not able to find it. And there's a long description then of the demise of God's people under his judgment because they forsake the ways of God. And yet the prophecy, the prophecy closes wonderfully with that plea and an appeal. He speaks of a day when he's going to raise up the fallen tabernacle of David. That's a vivid picture, isn't it? Not like these uh, pop-up tents. You pull them out of the bag now and suddenly, pow, they open up spring-loaded and they're standing in front of you. It's quite an amazing thing. To see, he's not talking about. It. He's talking about the old tents that we used to have with poles and guy lines, in which if the line broke, the whole thing would collapse. God says He's going to restore it. Verse eleven: On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. I'll raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. Verse fourteen: I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They'll build the waste cities and inhabit them. They'll plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They'll also make gardens and eat fruit from them. You see, this is so typical of God, isn't it? The Lord's concern in our lives is not judgment, but mercy. He speaks to us severely. He brings warnings to us directly. But his concern is not to chasten, 
but to restore and to heal and to beautify and to transform his people until we reflect his glory. That's God's purpose. And here were God's people in an awful condition. They were in a terrible state. Years of neglect and decline had ruined them. But still God speaks of restoration, of healing and mercy. Do you fear that you've gone too far? God who created all out of nothing, God who brought beauty from chaos and disorder, can make something of your life still. Listen again to to God's appeal, and I'll close with this, from chapter 5. In chapter 5 and verse 5, listen to his appeal. Thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. Verse 6, Seek the Lord and live. Verse 14, Seek good and not evil, that you may live. So the Lord of hosts will be with you. Amen. The Lord bless his word to us. Let's pray. Our gracious God, our heavenly Father, we thank you that still we may stand before you because we have a mediator in the person of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we bow before you and we bow before your word with thankfulness and praise. We thank you that your heart flows with a desire to bless us. And we pray, Lord, that you would come and do that, that you would help us by your grace to take you seriously, uh, that you would so fill our vision with the sight of yourself and of your glory, and that you'd enable us to live for your glory, so that we might be marked as your people, amongst whom you're pleased to dwell. We ask it for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen.